The Garden of Eden, Pandora's Box, and The Garden of Adonis are all stories about the sacred mushroom or the Amanita muscaria. The Talmud references Jesus as Ben Pandera, or Son of the Panther. Panther is an old epithet of the Amanita due to its spots. One variant of the Amanita is called the Amanita pantherina. It's also the favorite animal of Dionysus, who is another mushroom cult deity. So I believe that Pandora is another cognate of Pandera, or Panther, describing the Amanita mushroom. Other than the philological connection, the story of Pandora's box resembles that of the Garden of Eden. Prometheus steals the fire, and Pandora is then tempted to open the box. Eve is tempted by the serpent to eat from the fruits of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The serpent in the Garden of Eden is stealing the fire from the gods to give to humans. The Sumerian phrase Gan Eden means upright one of the garden, and found its way in the Bible as the Garden of Eden. Gan meaning garden. Specifically, it denotes a circular sort of object risen high. Garden of Eden, therefore, was a name for the mushroom and not a place. The upright of the garden being a fully matured mushroom. We'll simply pronounce this Sumerian Naaman, which kind of means stretch across the heavens. In Isaiah 17.10, he plants a plant of Naaman, and they grow in a day, and they will flee away in a day of grief and incurable pain. Naaman is also translated as delightful plants, and it's derivative of that Naaman up there in the Sumerian. The word is a reference to the overshadowing cap of the top of the mushroom, and this is what is meant by to stretch across the heavens. It's that overshadowing function of the Lord. In Ezekiel 18, he encounters a woman bewailing Tammuz. Tammuz is a Sumerian fertility god whose name kind of means son of life or the sun who rises, as in the mushroom that rises. Tammuz was identified with Adonis, and Adon means lord, again to denote that protective or overshadowing canopy. In Arabic, the Garden of Eden is Janat Adni, Garden of Adonis. Tammuz, Ishtar, Osiris, Isis, Adonis, Aphrodite, Jesus, and Mary, those are all dying and rising plant gods. The rituals of Tammuz and Adonis were performed by women who would plant seeds in a shallow pot. They would grow and wither very quickly, and so they would spend time lamenting and wailing as a sort of sympathetic magic in hopes of the rebirth of the god, of the mushroom which is what's happening here in Ezekiel. We saw again in Isaiah, where it was blossomed in the morning, and the harvest will flee away in a day. The Amanita will grow in a day, and by noon, it will have turned rotten, hence those above passages again. The mushroom will grow in a day, and by the end of that day, it will have rotted. In Jonah chapter 4, God gives him a plant to act as his shade. Again, we get that idea of shade. The next day it is destroyed by worms, and Jonah laments. It came into being in a night, and perished in a night. This is part two, and getting right into it, that same process of growing one day and dying the next is seen in the Exodus passage about the manna. Manna itself could be a play or a jumble of the word namanim from the Isaiah passage, which is from the Sumerian Naaman. So in the morning there was a layer of dew, and the dew went up, and behold, there was something in the wilderness, scale-like, small like the hoarfrost on earth. I believe the scale-like frost is a reference to the remnants of the universal veil that are scattered when the mushroom fully opens. Is it manna? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, That is the bread which Jehovah has given you for food. Moses said to them, Do not let anyone leave from it until morning. They did not listen to Moses, and some left it until morning, and it became rotten with maggots, and it melted in the heat of the sun. Again, the importance of shade is emphasized this time because the sun itself will destroy the fungus. Mushrooms are primarily water, and the sun will dry them out and let them rot faster. So the Sumerian Gan Naaman came to the Semitic languages as the Garden of Naaman, or the Garden of Adonis, or the Garden of Eden. In Isaiah 17, we saw Naaman also translated as delightful plant, which is why we also get Garden of Delights, aka Paradise. Garden of Eden also being a reference to paradise. The main idea of paradise in the Quran is the Garden of Delights, which is Janat Naim. The Janat being a cognate of Gan, and the Naim obviously being cognate of Naaman. The Garden of Delight is mentioned many times in the Quran, and in chapter 56 we can see the promise of paradise. So the paradise gardens of the Amanita was popular from Egypt to Greece and the Middle East, as far back as the Sumerians, and up until at least Muhammad, from which he must have gotten inspiration from surviving cults that had been driven out of the deserts when Christianity was purging its heresies. 
and ironically, these would have been truer practitioners of the religion than the misguided Christians. I also believe the Arabic Iman and the Hebrew Amen could also be cognates of the same Naaman. The taxonomical name Amanita we use today is also probably a cognate of Naaman. Other related words like Amrita and the Egyptian goddess of the underworld, Amenti or Amentet, may be hard to see but depicted with a mushroom on her head. The holy mountains off the coast of the Mediterranean used to be called the Amanus Mountains, which are now called the Nur Mountains. The Amana Mountain is referenced in the Song of Solomons, and the whole chapter is dedicated to the Amanita, which I can do in a future video. Amanita likes mountainous terrain as long as its symbiote trees are there. Many sky deity altars have been found in those mountains, and rain is seen as the seminal fluid which births these seedless mushrooms, hence the virgin births, and the god who is begotten of himself. Thunder or rain, which usually follows the presence of God in the Bible, increases the fruiting of mushrooms. This is part three, and it's the last part that'll round out the Garden of Eden and its sacred mushroom. Going right from where we left off, the tree of life is often a cedar, a pine, or an oak, or at least some other mycorrhizal tree with the amanita, depending on the region. The Lebanese cedar was famous in the ancient world, and it was useful for its wood and also for its sanctity due to its symbiote fruit. Gilgamesh seeks the key to immortality in a sacred cedar forest in Lebanon. Here's a quick reminder of the Lebanese flag with their famous cedar and the characteristic red and white of the Amanita. An important symbol to spirituality is the pine cone, which is the seeding fruit of the pine tree. And it's no coincidence that the pineal gland was named after the pine cone because its shape resembled it. The pine tree symbolizes many different mythologies, including the birth of Christ, of Dionysus Thyrsus, and the birth and death of Tammuz um, on December 25th. Adonis' death under a tree spawns magic flowers to grow. They were later misidentified as the anemone flowers, but originally I think they were the Amanita. And it was due to that misidentification that the rituals of the gardens of Adonis with the lamenting woman were sympathetic to the mushroom because overall the plants were probably lost. The language, the etymology, and the rituals survived and were probably lost and found over a number of years. Again, everyone from the Sumerians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and the Greeks, and then later the Christians, and with Muhammad, we have all of these different versions of this sort of garden of paradise, the dying and rising god. Back to the pinecone symbolism, the Amanita contains psychoactive chemicals which are GABA-A receptor agonists meaning they bind to receptors in the pineal gland, which induces its drug state. Again, the pine cone being a symbol of that spiritual connection because of the pineal gland being that same shape, being of the tree that grows mycorrhizally with the Amanita muscaria. Of course, every culture that depicts pine cones have pine trees, which means they can have Amanita muscaria growing with them. The Amanita mushroom was the ultimate key to paradise, the ultimate key to the spiritual life. It was literally seen as God on earth, God's son begotten of himself, because they were viewed as these seedless growths that seemed to have just come from rain. The sacred mushroom and the cross and Amanita lore is very deep and very dense, but I can continue to make kind of segmented parts um, going over different kind of interrelated ideas if you guys are interested. So that concludes this sort of segment on the Garden of Eden and how it relates to the Amanita Muscaria. Thanks for watching.